All right. So welcome to the second study in the book of Revelation. Uh, today we're going to go through the, well, we're going to go through chapters 4 all the way up to 8, so through 7. And this section is the, essentially encompasses the throne room of heaven, uh, the six seals, stuff like the four horses of the apocalypse, stuff like that that's well known. Yeah. Um, kind of keeping with the kind of explaining. So we went through last week, we went through the, the seven churches. So that was essentially the, the first vignette, the first uh, section. So now we'll see what is kind of played out through the seven churches, <clears throat> played out again here through the seven uh, seals of the scroll. So first, let's read through, uh, we're going to read through chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. After this, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven, with one seated on the throne. And he who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian. And around the throne was a rainbow <clears throat> that, had a pe that had the appearance of an emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and seated on the thrones were 24 elders, clothed in white garments, with golden crowns on their heads, from the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings, peals of thunder, and before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures, full of eyes in front, of, in front and behind, the first living creature, like a lion, the second living creature, like an ox, and the third living creature, with the face of a man, and the fourth living creature, like an eagle in flight. <clears throat> and the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within, and day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created." <clears throat> so in the first chapter here, we see the vision of the throne room. We see the throne room. Um, when it comes to studying the vision of the throne, it's important for us to know that and not to get lost in uh, the interpreting things that... Giving things more of a deeper meaning or deeper interpretation uh, than when there really is none. Um, it's important to note that these chapters do not give us a picture of heaven so it's not necessarily trying to describe this is what exactly heaven looks like it's describing and in essence this is describing the entire universe from the aspect of heaven and so that's how this whole uh, picture is trying to be set up the purpose of the vision is to show us that all things are governed by God this includes both our trials and tribulations so <clears throat> so I got a picture for us well, if I can get this thing to work. Oh. No, maybe I won't. <laughs> of course, technology doesn't want to work. I wrote through it earlier. I was wondering what it meant 
the appearance of Jasper and Carne- Carne- what? Carnelian, or I, I don't know how to say that word. That's yeah, it's a rare stone. Okay. <coughs> That's what I figured, like it was a stone of some type. Would you mind running back to the computer and being my button pressure for me? <laughs> oh, technology. It never works when we want it to. What about press? Just the space bar should be fine. Or, yeah. Did it work? Uh, take the cursor and go off the screen with it. You should get up there. And then click once it goes off the screen. And now press the race bar. Nothing? Of course, technology these days. Okay. All right, now we're back on track. Okay, so this is sort of a depiction of, it's the second slide, it'll be a depiction of how the throne room is set up by the descriptions. So at the center of the circle, you have the father. Father seated on his throne. You got the four living creatures. Surrounding him right there. Surrounding him. And then you have 24 thrones around him. And then the rainbow and everything on the outside of that. Right. <clears throat> and this is kind of, we haven't got to this point yet, but I'm in the midst of the living creatures and the thrones. You have the L standing there for the lamb who's going to be there. Where was that at? Uh, right there on the right side. I see it. Yeah. So, we see it talks about the elders. It talks about the elders and the living ones. And it's important to note that it specifically mentions 24 elders. Uh, so 24 elders seems to represent, uh, in a way, the entirety of the church. So it's representing the 12 patriarchs of the Old Testament, so the, the uh, 12 tribes of Israel. And then you have the 12 apostles of the New Testament. So 24 is encompassing the all of God's people from both the old and new dispensation. And so, because of this, it can be assumed that 24 elders represent the body of those who are redeemed, all worshiping God who is at the center of all things. And so, in a way, the 24 people are, or the 24 elders with their crowns are representing all of God's uh, church, worshiping God who is at the center of the whole universe. The next thing we see is the living creatures, or the living ones. Um, so the living ones, these living ones share stark resemblance to the cherubim and that they are around the throne in, as they are around the throne in Ezekiel. So in Ezekiel's vision of the throne of God, he sees the cherubim and he actually gives very similar uh, depictions of these beasts or these creatures around the throne so he even includes the same kind of physical features about the man the eagle the lion and the ox so what does the appearance of these cherubim represent these these appearances seem to express the abilities to follow whatever God commands these uh Creatures are at the command of God and are at the ready. They have the strength of a lion. They can render service like an ox. And they have intelligence like a man. And they have the swiftness of an eagle. So they're ever ready to be able to to bring to fruition anything that God commands who sits on the throne. They're always at the ready. So, this takes us into Five. five. Then I saw the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. 
a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. So, we have a couple of different images here. Firstly, we have the scroll. The scroll is a picture of God's eternal plan. So, uh, we see that there is writing both on the front and back, and that this uh, scroll is that God's eternal plan, his eternal decree, and that the opening of the seals does not just mean that God's plan is revealed to whoever opens it, but that it is also carried out by that person as well. So, we then see the next image here, is that we see, well, I think it's also interesting for us to note that uh, when spoken to, he's, uh, John hears of the lion, right? Lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. But when he looks at the lion, the lion is a slain lamb. So obviously the lion and the lamb are representing Christ as being both the lion and the lamb. Uh, through his death and resurrection, he is the only one who can carry out God's eternal plan. So we see here Christ sitting on the throne with God as our mediator, so that now God the Father rules the world through Christ. So Christ is taking the scroll, and he's the only one that can break the seals and carry out God's eternal decree and God's eternal plan. And we see the Lamb sits on the throne with God. So now we have the Lamb and God at the center of the world, or at the center of the universe, ruling over everything. And it's also kind of interesting to point out here is that there is, um, we also see in this a very beautiful, uh, picture of the Trinity here. So you have the Father sitting on the throne, you have the Lamb coming to sit on the throne with him, but it says that that um, as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And so we also have, and the seven spirits was spoken about as being the Holy Spirit, yeah. the Spirit of God. So we see the Trinity here too. So, so you have the Lamb, you have the Father, and in between them you have the Holy Spirit. Right. And so you have the Trinity displayed here as being the center of the universe. And that the Lamb is the one that can do the fulfilling of what uh, God's eternal plan is. So... All right. And so the se it says right here the seven horns with the seven eyes, which are the seven spirits. Is that just like a depiction of what? Yeah. So seven. It's important to note that seven, seven is the, is, the is number, number of completion and right. perfection. Right. So essentially, it's clarifying that he is fully holy, perfect. Yeah. Like he's spotless, like all knowing, all powerful, okay. just like yeah. God is. And so because that's the kind of the spirit is his own. It's, a lot of people get that mixed up. It's not like an it. It's yeah, a he's a he. Yeah, it's the a spirit's he. a he. He's yeah. not an it. It's not. He's he's alive and well. <laughs> <laughs> it's not. It's not an it or a thing. It's it's a he also. Yeah, he's a third person of the Trinity. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, he's also there. And a lot of people get that mixed up a lot. All right, so we're going to read through eight through fourteen. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb each holding a harp and, a gold, and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, 
Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels numbering numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing and i heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever and the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. So we so now we see essentially the response. So the lamb being slain is what was needed for God's eternal decree to be carried out. Right. So the lamb was the only one that can carry out that decree. And so here we see salvation. We see we see Christ's sacrifice, mm -hmm. and then we see essentially the response. Of that sacrifice, so now that he's at the center of every, that he is the center of the universe, uh, John records essentially three different do doxologies right here, from three different groups of people. The first doxology is sang out and and is sung by the people closest to the throne, so the elders and the cherubim. Yeah. They sing the first doxology, so you have he you you sort of have like the the center, the closest rejoicing. The second one, though, is sung out by the thousands upon thousands of angels. So now you have heaven rejoicing yeah. over this. But then lastly, we see that every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them also rejoice. So everything that lives upon the earth is also rejoicing in Christ being the lamb that was slain and him being seated on the throne. And so, this essentially just shows that Christ is the ruler of the whole universe, yeah. and that He has power to to carry out the plan. And so, with that, we kind of see the frameworks of of Christ's crucifixion on the cross. We see right. the kind of like the heavenly uh, the heavenly perspective of the universal result of Christ's crucifixion and sacrifice. And so with this, we move on, we're going to be moving on to the seven seals. And I think it's important for us to know that now that, so last week when we went through the seven churches, the seven churches were both, uh, were obviously literal seven churches that existed, but those were explanations of churches, of how churches are and will be until Christ returns and right. makes them right. So now we're essentially... Rewinding the picture again. Yeah. Now we're seeing Christ's crucifixion. Or, yeah, Christ's sacrifice, crucifixion on the cross. Salvation for us, right? And now we're going to go essentially back through the periods of history again. Yeah. But this time through the perspective of persecution. So essentially, um, kind of how I've heard it, which I think it makes sense, is that these are the these can also be called the seven seals of persecution yeah. because these all have to do with uh, afflictions that primarily are aimed towards the church and it has a lot of to impl it uh, you really see it implicating that this is this is what the church faces right. in these seven seals so and this is the fun part because everyone knows of the four horses of the apocalypse yeah. And so talking about that will be very fun. So, so I think it's important before we start is that the seals described are are the seals described in chapter six are symbolic of times and troubles of persecution, as we just talked about. Uh, the first four seals are the first four riders and their horses. Uh, this is very similar, like as I said before, uh, Revelation is constantly using a lot of imagery without directly quoting but constant imagery from the Old Testament. Right. So this is very similar to in Zechariah's 
Zachariah has visions of horsemen in his book, and they're very, very similar, even down to color. And, and scripture, horses, horse, is typically connected with concepts such as strength, terror, warfare, conquest. Yeah. And so you can kind of see the, the, the theme going on when it's talking about horsemen, right? Yeah, what it's getting at, what, what they are, are about to mean, which we're about to read. Mm -hmm. So let's get to the first seal. Now I watched when the Lamb opened one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures say, with a voice like thunder, Come. And I looked, and behold, a white horse, and its rider had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he came out, conquering and to conquer. So, I feel like there's a lot of confusion on or misconceptions on what the white horse represents. So, like last week when we were going through the dispensational premillennialism view, as I have been taught it in the past um, by people who believed it, they would view the white horse as representing the Antichrist or the beast. See, that's what I actually read that today when I was in the blue, the blue letter Bible app, mm -hmm. and it said. I was, one of the commentaries that he goes over and he, he was like, I think this represents the Antichrist, but he didn't give like an explanation. He was just like, I think it's that. Yeah. And I was like, but it kind of sounds like it's Christ. Yeah, and so that's what, I'm, that's what I was going to say, is that a lot of people try to say that this is the Antichrist, but I would argue that this is representative of Christ. Mm -hmm. So that's, this is the, the, the first horseman is representing Christ and that this is Christ preceding his, uh, after his church. So wherever, essentially, wherever Christ goes, he's conquering. So as his gospel is spreading throughout the world, he is conquering and he's conquering currently. Yeah. Um, we can see this, that this can, this can be deduced that the horse is white, and white, and the color white is always associated with holiness in the Bible. The rider has a crown of gold. This shows the kinghood. So he has the kinghood of Christ. And finally, when, whenever the word conquer occurs, it always refers to, except for two exceptions, Christ or his church. So John, whenever he's using the word conquer, he's always referring to either Christ or his church, except for two cases. And those are specified. It's very obvious that he's not talking about Christ and the church yeah. in those cases. And so... Um, Kind of some examples to also kind of go along with this depiction is Matthew 24 and Psalm 45, 3 through 5. So if you'll turn to Psalm 45 for me, I'll get to Matthew 24. All right, I'm there. All right, read Psalm 45 for me. 3, three through 5? Yes. Gird your sword. Gird your sword on your... On your thigh, O mighty one, in your splendor and majesty. In your majesty, ride out victoriously for the causes of truth and meekness and righteousness. Let your right hand teach you awesome, deed, awesome deeds. Your arrows are sharp in the heart of the king's enemies. The peoples fall under you. Yeah. So even in that psalm, which is a, a uh, messianic psalm, uh, Prophecy. Right. Even at Psalm, he even uses the same imagery of bow and arrow as we see with the conquering of the white horse. And what's also important as we go through these segments is Matthew 24. Matthew 24 is practically just a straight up outline of this section. Really? <laughs> Seriously, it is. As we go through it, you see just a practically straight outline of this uh, whole section that we're going through. So, Matthew 24. As he sat on the Mount of Olives, and this is starting in verse 3, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered him, See that no one leads you astray, for many people will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. And you will hear of wars and rumors of war. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place. But the end is not yet, for nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, 
and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are but the beginning of the birth pains. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another, and many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of my uh, the love of many will grow cold, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. And so he kind of gives us examples, like almost verbatim, of how we're going to see this going through. So, the white horse is representing Christ, and obviously the advance of Christ's kingdom as the gospel is carried out. And it's important to know that that when these that these other horsemen are essentially following the white horsemen out, right? Yeah. And we can see this as essentially the idea is that wherever uh, Christ goes and wherever uh, people turn to Christ and are accepted, persecution and hardship follow. Yeah, they're going to follow. Yeah, persecution and hatred of the truth is going to follow along with Christ. Mm -hmm. And so those things are going to come right after it. And so that moves us to the red horse. Red horse. So when he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come, and out and out came another horse, bright red. Its rider was permitted to take peace from the earth so that people should slay one another, and he was given a great sword. So, what's another kind of misconception about this is typically when most people read of the red horse, they interpret the red horse as just meaning warfare in general. And I would argue that it's not talking about general warfare and and for multiple reasons so that well I would say that instead of general warfare that what this is talking about is uh, slaughtering as in persecution of Christians specifically yeah. so essentially the nations and the kingdoms and everything that are coming against the Christians to kill and destroy them um, reasons for this is because as we look further this whole, further in this vision, this whole vision is in the context of martyred saints. So this whole vision is in the context of those who have been martyred for the faith. And so it's all about the persecution of the church. So general warfare in this vision specifically with all the other nations isn't kind of mentioned here. Um, second, we also can look at the language that John uses, right? So John uses the word slay being the past present of the word slaughter. Mm -hmm. um, this is exam in this example because every time except for one exception, whenever John uses either slay or slaughter or a, that sort of term, he is always referring to either Christ or the church. Yeah. There's only one exception for that, and that's uh, Revelation 13.3 uh, when the beast is slaughtered yeah. at the end, right? So, we can kind of deduce from that, and that and that even extends outside of Revelation itself. Even in his epistle, First John, he does the same thing. And so we can kind of deduce from that that what he's talking about here is the slaughtering of of believers, right. specifically the persecution of believers in this case. Um, and also, it's important for us to look at. We gotta get some Greek in there for you. Yeah. <laughs> That is important that we can look at is that he that it's translated here that he was given a sword. So the word sword here is a uh, makiria. It's really when translated into the Greek, it has more of a condemnation of when it's being used. It's used typically as a sort of like a a knife that has a dull side yeah. and then a sharp edge. So it's more along what we would consider a single-bladed knife. 
not a sword that you'd see like a soldier. Like a battle sword. Yeah, a battle sword that you would be carrying. Mm-hmm. And the connotations with this would mean that that this would be an instrument that was used for sacrifices. So in the Septuagint, Septuagint translation of the Old Testament, when we're talking about the sacrifices and like animals being slain on the altar, they use this same word, makiria, as the translation for that. And also, Jesus, when he talks about that I did not come, yeah, when he talks about in Matthew 10, 34, when he says, I came not to send peace but a sword, he even uses the same word there. This is contrast to what we would think of a Greek sword, which would be the double-sided blade that we would view like a Roman soldier carrying, which it would actually have been the uh, um, the Greek word. Uh, uh, I'm trying to pronounce this word. Hold on, Xiphos. Xiphos. Mm-hmm. So that would have been the type of sword that was used as single-handedly for battle. Yeah. So that's not the kind of sword he was given here. So specifically, it's everything's pointing to the idea that this is slaughtering in the sense of sacrificing so that we are being that the that the blood of the saints are being spilt for uh for as the same way that the like the lamb is slaughtered so that moves us on to the black horse so when he opened the third seal i heard the third living creature say Come, and I looked, and behold, a black horse, and its rider had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard what seemed to be a voice in the midst of the four living creatures, saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and the wine. So, some people would also interpret the black horse as referring to famine. But... Uh, I would also say here, if we're looking at it into a persecution sense, that this is not referring to famine, that this is referring to um, essentially poverty and riches. So if we look at the measurements that are given here, so he, he has a scale and it says a quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius. A quart of wheat for a denarius would be Back then, it would be an entire person, a a daily wage for a person. So everything they made in a day would go toward getting a quart of wheat, which is like barely enough to feed yourself. And then, or you could get three quarts of barley for a denarius, which would be not as good as wheat, but it'd feed more people like your family, right? But, and it says, do not harm the oil and the wine. Oil and wine would have been the luxuries that the rich would have had. So in this sort of system, if I'm only making a denarius a day, then I'm going to be in poverty and suffer. While the rich wouldn't suffer from this. They could pay it, right? <clears throat> so what's implied here is that what comes as the uh what comes as the repercussions in a way of being a believer is the persecution in the sense of poverty. So, and we can even see this in our own day, which I would say this also extends into our own day. How many times that that those who are rich are typically the most immoral people yeah. because they have no moral obligation. They have no reason to go, I can't do that. Because they are willing to, to do it. Yeah, they're willing to take anything to be rich, right? Where a Christian may go, I can't work on Sunday. That's going to lose money in the long run, right? Or there's a job that is trying to have them do something that's immoral to their values, of the Christian values and what Christ teaches us to do. That's going to harm the job and the context. So, And also there's just the general persecution that comes along with it that would lead to poverty that a Christian could not... Uh, wouldn't always be able to have the ability to have that state of power that the other. So what kind of follows a lot of times with in this persecution sense is poverty comes out of out of following Christ sometimes and that's kind of the uh, the persecution that's going on here. 
Um, and that's kind of the contrast that's going out with do not harm the oil of the wine. So it's something that the, the Christian won't get to have the same luxuries and the same things that the rich will get to have, the immoral will get to have. Yeah. Because, I mean, it kind of just goes back to our riches are not of this world. Yeah. Our riches are stored up in heaven. And I like to think of uh, when we talked about... Uh, Ecclesiastes, where it's all vanity mm -hmm. in this world. It's all vanity. It's all pointless. All riches, like you just said, they're not of this world. And then that gives us, lastly, into the pale horse. Mm -hmm. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and its rider's name was Death. And Hades followed him. And they were given authority over a fourth of the earth to kill with the sword and with famine and with pestilence and by wild beasts of the earth. <clears throat> so, we got the pale horse here. And this is where you see the famine and the pestilence and all the mm -hmm. craziness come back to start happening. Yeah. And that's where we were just talking about how the others were against like the church and everything. And now this is... Well, even in this one, I would say it's it's against the church, but in a different way, right? Yeah. It's the church still having to suffer through other outside things, right? Yeah. And so, and the pale horse is death, and he, and where death goes, uh, and Hades Always. follows him, right? Which Hades is is essentially the term for uh, like the underworld, like being buried, right? So like you're gonna be put in the ground, right? So what follows death is, is famine and pestilence and the sword. But, and getting back to the sword thing, is that this is not Macaria here. This is Ramphaya, <laughs> Ramphaya <Yeah. laughs> which is actually the term that's used for a great sword, which would have been something used in battle. So it's emphasizing war here. Right. And this doesn't necessarily, I wouldn't say this necessarily means war against Christians, but it means war in general. So, like, obviously, if a Christian's in poverty or already being persecuted, if war breaks out, suffering's going to happen. Of course, yeah. Um, and typically, kind of, it follows just about the just about the outline it gives, right? War happens, then famine sets in because of war, which means people start going hungry because there's not resources. And then after, when famine starts setting in, pestilence sets in. People die, get sick, right? Yeah. Um, if you if you turn over for me to Ezekiel fourteen twenty one, you'll see that he pretty much says the exact same thing in Ezekiel fourteen twenty one. Just about. Okay, <laughs> I'll let you get there. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but it's. But I would say that this is also evidence to show that. The black horse doesn't mean famine, yeah. and that the red horse doesn't mean war, because we see that the pale horse means war and famine and pestilence and right. death in general. And that's what I was making. Like you, that's mm -hmm. when all of this is coming in with the pale horse, and that's when other people were, I guess you'd say, getting it wrong by the other two or three horses, or three horses, because this is the fourth horse. Mm -hmm. All right, fourteen twenty-one. Yes. For thus says the Lord God, How much more when I send upon Jeru Jerusalem my four disastrous acts of judgment, sword, famine, wild beast, and pestilence, to cut off from it man and beast. Yeah. So even uh, in Ezekiel, those are the four uh, judgments that are, are being given against Israel, right? right? So, and these exemplify that these are the persecutions that the church are going to uh, face yeah. but kind of concluding the four horsemen <clears throat> because it's probably I would say the four horsemen of the apocalypse is probably one of the better most well known images from Revelation that people know even if people don't generally know I guess about the four horsemen or what they are or what they mean people have probably heard of the four horsemen yeah. but 
Um, I think it's also important for us to know that though the four horsemen are here, the four horsemen are still um, they are still under the control of God. Yeah. So God is still in control. Like He permits these things to take place, right? Yeah. Um, we see this as the He's in control of everything. Yeah, the red horseman was permitted to take peace, mm -hmm. and he was given a great sword. It was given to him. And the pale horseman is given authority over a fourth of the earth. Like, God is ultimately in control of all things and all events that take place. Even these events and things that take place. You can see all that when you read. Yeah, and even with the pale horse, I can see, we can see this as he's still, like, we see, really see God's authority over it because God is going, you have a fourth of the earth and that's all you get. Yeah. Right? Like, that is the extent and that's all I'm allowing. And so even God is in control of all these things. And so I think that should also give us comfort that those, these, though that these are things that we will experience in our lives and until Christ returns, all of these things. Yeah, they're, I mean, they're going on today. Yeah, they're going on today. Look around the world. There's all sorts of persecutions. Yeah. Uh, Famine. Famines and pestilence and Seasons. wars and diseases and all sorts of stuff. I mean, even just consider... You doesn't take long to look back in history even like you get like the black death coming in and all these things like you get I mean that's why we call it the black death right because it brought death right yeah. like it's just uh, it's but it's to know that all of these things will one day come to an end yeah. and we start to see this here so we get to the uh, the fifth seal mm -hmm. so we got the fifth seal here and this is the cry of the martyrs. So, when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete, who were to be killed as they themselves had been. So you got the cry of the martyrs. We, now we see, well, one, we clearly see that this is an emphasis on persecution towards Christians because uh, this whole, that this is all from a martyr perspective. It's calling these people martyrs that suffer these persecutions yeah. for Christ, right? Um, so here we see the cry of the saints that have been martyred. They're essentially asking, when will God's judgment be? And it's what we've asked forever, right? Yeah. People ask it all the time. God, when you're, when's Christ returning? When's he coming back? It's a very common question still. <laughs> yeah, it's still a very common question, and it will be a very common question all the way to the end, right? And so, but then what's God's response to that question? God's response, that question is his judgment will not be, will be until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete, who were to be killed as they themselves had been. So this gives us a picture of when Christ will return. When will Christ return to judge the world? When every elect person, every person that is elect unto salvation by God's eternal decree comes to salvation, Christ will return. Yep. That, there, that none of the elect will be lost, that God has them all in his plan, and in that eternal plan that Christ was able to carry out, that there will not be one left behind, that all who are elect of God will be saved. Which is a should be a, a hallelujah for us, right? That none of them are going to be lost, right? Like, even if even if it takes another thousand years or more, right? Like, the timeline is essentially how do we know when he's coming back? Well, when all of them are saved, yeah. and that also should I think also should open us up to the idea that there aren't going to be visual signs that we can tell of, right? Yeah which I would say is not what Revelation is trying to show us. It's not trying to show us that, well, once you see this event, it's, almost, it's, it's so many years away, right? That's not what Revelation is trying to teach us here. 
In fact, it's teaching us the opposite of that. It's teaching us even more sharply what Christ told us, that we would never know no. the day that he returns. Yeah, no one will know. Because just in the same way that I can't tell you who the elect are completely, where I can't just go, he's an elect, he's an elect, he's an elect, he's an elect. Yeah. The, I can't tell you how many elect there will be. And so ultimately I can't tell you when Christ will return. Yeah. And so Christ will return when all the elect are saved, which will happen. Yes, it will. <laughs> but then this leads us into the sixth seal. And this is actually a really interesting seal. Because so far what we've seen, we've seen essentially that replaying of, of essentially the history of the church age. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the cross the persecutions taking on within it, the martyrs screaming out, they're crying out and praying to God of when will he come. And now the sixth seal is the final judgment. Yeah. So we see the coming of Christ in the sixth seal. So when he opened up the sixth seal, I looked and behold, there was a great earthquake and the sun became black as sackcloth and the full moon became like blood and the stars of the sky fell to the earth as the fig tree sheds its winter fruit when shaken by a gale. The sky vanished like a scroll that is being rolled up and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Then the kings of the earth and the great ones and the generals and the rich and the powerful and everyone, slave and free, hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. Calling to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand? So the sixth seal is the judgment. Yeah. And this judgment is what awaits the wicked. And we can specifically see here that we can, and there's kind of little hints to us that shows that the class of men who will be facing this judgment and that fear of, that, of the wrath of the Lamb are the wicked. Um, kind of interesting little things to note is that in the sixth seal, it affects six objects of creation. So we see earthquake, sun, moon, uh, stars, uh, I think, it's, yes, sky. The fig trees. And so we see sixth um, and mountain and island. So we see six, it's in the sixth seal, there's six objects of creation, and then there's six classes of men that'll be uh, affected by it. You know, the, the kings, the great ones, the generals, the rich, the powerful, and then everyone, slave and free. Yeah. So there's six classes of people. So kind of adding that up, what number do we get out of that? Six, 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 right? Yeah. yeah. So I think that we can see here is that that's implying that it's that this judgment has been carried out on the wicked. That this is not the this is the judgment and the wrath of the Lamb on those who are not the elect. Exactly. And we see that that the fear of this wrath is so intense that they would rather take death than handling that wrath, than taking that wrath head on. Yeah. For Great for the great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand? And that just shows the power of it, right? Yeah. Like the, the, just the intensity and how powerful the the lamb is, and how, no matter how great. What that coming uh, is about to be like for. Yeah. Wicked, yeah. And it's for all who are not saved. Exactly. Kings of the earth who think they're the most powerful, even to the most lowly, mm -hmm. who aren't will go, will be in utter fear of that when that comes. But then we get into chapter 7. So I'm actually going to read through the whole chapter because this has to do with the entirety of the sealed multitude. So after this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth. holding back the four winds of the earth, 
that no wind might blow on earth or sea or against any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun with the seal of the living God, and he called with a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the earth and sea, saying, Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of the sealed, 144,000, sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. 12,000 from the tribe of Judah were sealed, 12,000 from the tribe of Rehoboam, 12,000 from the tribe of Gad, 12,000 from the tribe of Asher, 12,000 from the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000 from the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000 from the tribe of Simon, 12,000 from the tribe of Levi, 12,000 from the tri tribe of Issachar, 12,000 from the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000 from the tribe of, Josh of Joseph, 12,000 from the tribe of Benjamin were sealed. After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. And they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these clothed in white robes, and from where have they come? I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God, and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to, the, to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. So essentially, in this chapter, so we saw the first half of it, right? The first half of the sixth seal showed us the judgment on the wicked. The second half of the sixth seal showed us the, the sealing of the righteous. So, um, I would say that's also re-emphasizing that the, when it's talking about that the, the angels that are holding back the corners of the earth that'll, that'll bring destruction on the earth. And the other angel says, not until we have sealed all of them. Mm -hmm. So not until all the elect have come to salvation can, will destruction, will the judgment happen yeah. on the earth. So in the beginning of this chapter, we see the beginning start with the four angels having power to harm the earth. Another angel speaks and tells them not to harm the earth until the servants of God are marked. Um, that this exemplifies that the final judgment cannot come upon the elect of God. Well, then we see the number 144,000. Yeah. And this also, this word has also, or word number, has had a lot of different meanings. But before I kind of get into the number, I wanted to add that we see here that um, that the seal that the angel is bringing, they sealing the people in their head. And what's important to know about the seal and kind of the imagery that's being brought on here by a seal is we look at it as in, in the idea of um, the seal that a king would use. So back in times when we had kings and different things like that mm -hmm. a royal seal would have been an emblem that they put in the wax that held a letter shut yeah. right and so what did that seal represent the seal represented that it was of uh, that it was the property of the kings it it warranted who was allowed to touch it and who was allowed to who was allowed to read it and use it right only the king and whoever the king allowed and so it it 
presents the ownership up to the king. But also the, on the foreheads, and later we'll see that, the, that those who, it'll talk about later in Revelation, about those who receive the mark on their forehead and on their hand of God, the seal. But then we'll also see that contrast with people who have the mark of the beast on the forehead on their, and on their hands. Yeah. And what that is exemplifying here is that when we see in the Old Testament, we see God uh, explaining or telling the Israelites when, when in, I believe it's Deuteronomy. Yeah, in Deuteronomy, he's explaining to the Israelites, telling them that they need to have the word, the word of God written on their head and on their hand. And then he proceeds to go on, like on the on the on the on your doorpost, and and you talk about it at the dinner table, and all these things, right? Well, obviously, you literally could not write the whole Bible yeah. on your head and on your hand. It's not enough room. <laughs> I mean, I got a pretty big forehead, but I don't got that big of a forehead. But <laughs> I got a five head. But. Um, but what that what is that exemplifying? So he's telling the Israelites what he's actually telling them. He's telling them that that the head representing authority, our authority should be the word of God, and their, their work with their hands should be the work of God, should be uh, controlled by the word of God. So here, those who are sealed, who are the elect of God, their authority on their head, their authority is God, and then later on when it talks about their on their hands, then their hands are also the they do are controlled by God, the work of God. Contrasting that to those who have the mark of the beast, whose work and head is for the beast, as the contrast, right? Vice versa. Basically. Vice versa, right? So it's the the contrasting between the elect and the non elect. And so, but now let's get into 144,000. This is where the fun comes in. We get to talk about numbers. <laughs> So 144,000 not, does not literally coincide with how many people are to be saved. So it's not how some Jehovah's Witnesses would try to interpret it as there's only going to be 144,000 people in heaven, which I'm pretty sure even in their own belief they've already gotten to that number already. Yeah. But, uh, but only God knows how many people are actually to be saved. So this number is actually supposed to be representing of a large multitude, yeah. right? Like... John can tell us the exact number of how many people are going to be saved because yeah. only God knows how many are supposed exactly. to be saved, right? And so, but the number is both a play on biblical numerology and, and is used just to exemplify a great multitude. And how it plays on biblical numerology, we kind of saw it previously with the elders, right? So the Trinity, three, uh, you multiply that by the four. So we saw that with like the four winds of the earth, right? with the universe, representing the universe. So the Trinity working within the universe, three times four, 12. Yeah. We get like the 12 patriarchs of the Old Testament, 12 apostles of the, 12 New, apostles of the New Testament. Testament. You multiply 12 and 12, what do you get? 144. You times 144 by 1,000, 144,000, right? Like you get the kind of the gist going on here. And 1,000, and which I would also say goes along with when the Bible is talking about a thou that Christ reigns for a thousand years. That a thousand is ten times ten times ten, which is a perfect cube. So it's talking about a perfect space of time that's a long but perfect time that Christ rules, which is why we are in the millennial reign of Christ as the church age. Yeah. That Christ is reigning in his kingdom in heaven. Mm -hmm. And so, during this time. So, we kind of see the same thing going on here. And so that's 144,000 are those who are going to be saved. And just also back that up, and then he breaks it down to 12 to 12 to 12 to 12 to 12 of each one of the tribes. So that the whole, so essentially he's saying that every, the whole of God's people are saved. Yeah. That there's none left, it's perfect. The number is rounded, it's perfect. The perfect. But I would also say that John even is not meaning to exemplify an exact number here, even by his next statement and next verse, right? Because then he goes, after this, I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. Right. So we see that even he couldn't exemplify that 
to the full extent that the 144,000 is just a representation of the whole of the church. That is the perfect whole of the church, that there's none going to be left out, none left behind. Mm -hmm. And it's also kind of important with the, the 12 tribes is uh, a lot of, uh, I'd say, dispensationalists and premillennials, they hold to the 12 tribes, meaning literally that there will be 12,000 people from each one of the Jews, from each, specifically from each one of these tribes. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't say that that literally represents the 12 tribes because even, well, I mean, if you took the Jews today, none of, just about none of the Jews knows what tribe they came from. Yeah. Like, and so many Jews today weren't, aren't actually ethnically Jewish really anymore. Mm -hmm. There's so many uh, offshoots and, and breeding, right? But that the tr that even even at John's time that wouldn't even made sense because uh, even by John's time, like ten out of the twelve tribes were lost; yeah. they didn't exist really anymore. And then the last two got scattered once the temple was destroyed in seventy A.D. Yeah. So, which was before he even wrote Revelation. Yeah. So I won't even say that this really assumes that there needs to be a that there is a literal number of Jews that will be saved. I would say that this is just encompassing all of God's people yeah. in general, not just a specific number from specific tribes. So, just kind of clearing the air with that one, right? <laughs> <laughs> and so then we see the second half of it, that the sealed multitude. Uh, so last way we see the great scene of all the elect of God worship the Lord saying salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Mm -hmm. And then the last thing we see in this section is then we see the uh, we see from the elder that speaks with John. These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. Mm -hmm. And so this is exemplifying the church coming out of the great tribulation. And previously, at the introduction, John says that he was a partner with us in the tribulation. Yeah. So I'd say that he's even implying that he is living through the tribulation, through too. just like we're living through the tribulation, that all the church lives through the tribulation period. The tribulation period is the age of the church, where we're all being persecuted and the world hates us because we are telling the truth, yeah. and the world hates the truth. And so that this scene is... That heavenly scene where, where the final judgments come and, and, and victory has been proclaimed. Victory, it's done. It's done. Yeah. And, and that's really the beauty of it. And this, um, and this leads into, uh, well, well, that's in my slides, but it'll lead into the seventh seal. Mm -hmm. But, before we get there, we have this last sort of song that sings, Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living water and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And just even in that, we get so many images of other points when it's talking about heaven, right? Yeah. In the Old Testament and other points, places in the Bible. I mean, just a couple is like that it really reminds me of is the new heavens and new earth that's described in Isaiah. Yeah. He also mentions that, that there will be no tears there, um, that there will be no hunger um, and we also see in some of the Psalms, right? Like the, the comparison of for the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd. David, like the famous uh, hymn, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures, right? He leads me beside still waters. He leads me by still waters. He, he, he will guide them to springs of living water, right? Like we have the, we have that same symbolism of what heaven is like. And so, I would say obviously what's implying here is heaven, and so and then this leads us into the final and seventh uh, the seventh seal, which I'll go ahead and cover. So we're just going to go through chapter eight to verse five, and then we'll end.
because then we're getting onto the seven trumpets. Yeah. <laughs> but when the Lamb opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Then I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and seven trumpets were given to them. And another angel came and stood at the altar with a golden, golden censer, and he was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints rose before God from the hand of the angel. Then the angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar and threw it on the earth. And there were peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. And so, with the final seal, the seventh seal that is opened by the Lamb, we see now, we'll see, well, we will see that out of the seventh seal of persecution comes the seven trumpets of judgment that is on the world. And once again, we'll see next week when we start to get into the seven trumpets, we'll see the replay of this whole scene again of the world. But this way, but this time through a different perspective, once again. And you can see how powerful this seven still is when there's a silence in heaven. Yeah. For half an hour, like everybody's just like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the silence that comes from the seventh seal. And I think there's also kind of, you could also kind of draw symbolism to this, like there's a silence, there's a rest, yeah. there's a time that it stops. And just images of that come to mind of, of you know, creation, right? The seventh day God rested. Mm -hmm. And so it's just this super powerful moment. Yeah. And so, and now it, and then as we look at the seven trumpets, we'll see seven trumpets of judgment on the earth. Yeah. And that these will be a replaying of the church events again, of the world uh, this time. Though, mm -hmm. so, as we go through it again, the yeah. story again, and we'll keep going through the same story, but from different perspectives, essentially, as we go through the book of Revelation. Yeah. So, <laughs> any questions? Comments? Yeah, good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm going to pray and then. Lord, thank you for us being able to come together and study your word and to learn more about you. Uh, I thank you for, though the book of Revelation can be intimidating, it can be um, sometimes difficult to understand, Lord, but I pray that you'll just give us your Holy Spirit, that these things can be made clear to us and that, these, that we'll be able to interpret and know these things. Lord, keep us, keep us to have the understanding that John initially gave us to have that that what is the purpose of this book the purpose of this book is not to try to read out future events so that we can have some sort of uh, knowledge of when Christ returns but but that this book is supposed to give us hope and to incline us to salvation Lord and to seeking after you so just keep that ever on our hearts as we study this book that this should give us joy and it should give us hope to know that as we just read through here that the six seals or the yeah the six seals of persecution that though the church goes through all of these persecutions and all these age and we cry out when will Christ return the hope of it is, is that that sixth seal will come and that Christ will return and he will be he will bring judgment and he'll bring uh, care and, and safety for those he has sealed, Lord. I pray that you keep this message with us as we go throughout our week and our lives, forever giving this hope and this security and this, and this just great blessing on us, Lord. of what you did for us, sending your son to die on the cross as we just saw here, Lord. In your holy and precious name I pray, amen. Amen. Ooh.